Hi, I'm excited to share with you today Memory Bound Pursuit, or MBP, and to discuss computational models of cross-situational word learning with memory integrated into them. As a starting point, in early word learning, infants must match up objects with their corresponding word labels. When they hear the word dog, there are a plethora of other objects that the word could be referring to, such as the dog's ball, another animal like a cat, which could be in the same room, or a bone. This is a problem known as referential ambiguity. A solution is that learning happens across co-occurrences of words and objects. That is, as the infant continues to encounter a word label with its corresponding object meaning, they can learn that word meaning pair. In the realm of computational modeling, there are two flavors of approaches. First, the local or hypothesis testing approach, in which the learner maintains just one hypothesized meaning for each word. So here they would remember that the word dog appeared with a hypothesis such as the ball. Um, let's say that next time they hear the word dog, the ball isn't present, so they can make a new hypothesis, um, which could be the correct object, the dog. In the second approach, the global model, learners use all of their previous experiences to learn. The learner keeps track of all co-occurrences of words and meanings, so here they would remember that the word dog showed up with the ball, the dog, the cat, and the bone. Then they would tabulate that and learn the word meaning pair that, uh, that appears together the most. With these different approaches, there are several big questions that we want to address. First, how do we account for development? It's uncontested that adults perform much better at these sorts of tasks than children, but many models do not capture this explicitly. Also, how do we account for individual differences? Are these models able to learn homophones? How do they react to different orders of presentation, and how does that compare with human learners? With a simple, with a simple mechanism for memory that complements word learning models, we address all of these questions. It is known that word learning involves many cognitive processes, and most models do have a notion of memory, but these models have not yet systematically been compared to human performance. We integrate memory into both local and global computational models and evaluate performance across a wide range of behavioral studies. The base for, a local, for our local model is Pursuit, which is a more robust variant of Propose But Verify. Like Propose But Verify, the model pursues its, the best hypothesis at any given time. But unlike the original model, Pursuit maintains disconfirmed hypotheses and counts of referential success. The lexicon is created at the end based on a threshold parameter um, that has been tuned, and memory is coded as a recall parameter set to 0.75. This means that 75% of the time, the model can access its memory, and the other 25% it randomly guesses. Let's go through a quick example. Let's see, say that we see the word mypen with these three objects, the cat, the elephant, and a crab. We don't have any additional information, so we um, just make a hypothesis. Let's say the elephant. Um, now we see the word might been again, and our hypothesis, our hypothesis is confirmed. So we increment the score. Now we see the word might been again, with our hypothesis confirmed yet again, so we increment the score, and now it's three. Now this time we see the word might been, and our hypothesized meaning isn't there. Remember that we don't keep track of previous instances, so we don't remember that it's the dog that appeared with Mipen twice, while the bear and cat appeared only once. So at this point, we're just selecting a new meaning. Since the elephant was disconfirmed, it's penalized, and we pick a new hypothesized meaning, let's say a cat, and we reward it. Now we see the word Mipen with both the elephant and the cat. But remember, we pursue only the best hypothesis, which in this case is the elephant, and so we increment the score for just the elephant to three, and the score for the cat stays the same. I hope that makes sense. We incorporate memory by using a mechanism that aligns with the atkinson schifrin modal model of memory, which separates the, lexi the learned lexicon from the memory buffer. The memory buffer is limited in size, which means that the model can learn only so many meanings, so many words at once. Um, sorry, it's constraining the number of words, not the number of meanings that the model can learn. 
We incorporate the idea of rehearsal by mod updating the buffer and moving the word to the top of the buffer when it is encountered, capturing a recency effect in memory. When the buffer is full, a random word with its hypothesized meanings and corresponding association scores is forgotten, capturing the primacy effect. This is the most recent development in the model to account for a developmental story of memory. With this modification, the results presented in the paper remain unchanged as we present studies with adult participants whose memory buffer buffers are large enough that the impacts are insignificant. This is the simplest mechanism for memory, and it's easily integrated into both Pursuit and the global learning model for comparison. Um, let's see what, what happens when MBP encounters a word. First, it checks the lexicon. If it's there, then we look for the learned meaning in the scene. And if the learned meaning is present, then we continue, as there's no learning to be done. If, however, the learned meaning is not present, then we go into the word learning process. Also, if the word is not yet in the lexicon, then we have to learn it. In the word learning process, we first check the memory buffer. Um, if the word is not in the memory buffer, then we want to add it. If the memory buffer is full, then we delete randomly, like we mentioned previously. Once there's space, we add the encountered word. We also select a hypothesis using mutual exclusivity and set the association value to zero. If the word is in the memory buffer, then we check to see if the best hypothesized meaning um, is present as pursuit does. If the best hypothesized meaning is present, then we pursue it, which means we increment the association score by one. We compare the association score to the score of its closest competitor, and if it exceeds twice that, then we add it to the lexicon. If the hypo best hypothesized meaning is not, is not present, then we select another hypothesized meaning from the scene and reward it. Note that the incorrect hypothesis is not penalized, and this, uh, this makes updating the scores simplified. Here are the key differences between MBP and the original pursuit model. First, and most importantly, the limited memory is an independently justified parameter. This parameter constrains the size of the memory buffer. Also, instead of having a tuned threshold value, we compare scores to the closest competitors, motivated by Weber's law that quantity difference is saliently perceivable on the logarithmic scale. We built the lexicon incrementally rather than compiling it at the end, allowing the model to be learning words continuously and giving it the opportunity to learn homophones. Put simply, MBP learns a hypothesized meaning for a word only if the word stays in the memory buffer long enough for it to dominate other competitor meanings. We also incorporate memory into a global model based on um, the global model of cross-situational learning presented by Fosley et al. The co-occurrences are tabulated across all learning instances using a reinforcement style learning probabilistic adjustment. The memory buffer limits the number of words that the model can learn concurrently, but note that it doesn't constrain the other dimension, that is, the number of meanings that the word is associated with. Additionally, like MBP, we build the lexicon incrementally, checking after each learning instance to see if the association score exceeds the threshold value, which has been tuned to the childish Rollins corpus. At testing, we use this process of retrieval. First, if the word is in the lexicon, then we check to see if there's a single, le single learned meaning, and if there is, we choose that single meaning. If there are multiple meanings, then we choose from the options weighted equally. This would be the equivalent of if someone asked you, what does bat mean? It can either mean a flying mammal or a tool that you use in, um, in the sport, baseball. Since you don't have an additional context, you can just pick one. If the word is not in the lexicon, then we check the memory buffer. Um, because in all these experiments, testing happens right after learning, we assume that the memory buffer is available to the participants. If the word's in the memory, uh, if the word is in the memory buffer, then we sample from the hypotheses weighted by association score. The behavior is different than if the word is in the lexicon because the word meaning pair is not yet learned, and so there's more uncertainty. If the word is not in the memory buffer, then we just randomly select a meaning. We tested these learning models on various experiments, and we introduced individual variation by the differences in memory development, so the uh, size of the memory buffer, and we did this by having a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 1 centered around a mean of 10, which is similar to the value um, or the number of objects that adults can be learning concurrently. 
These models have stochastic behavior both from the sampling of memory buffer size and from the hypothesis selection, so we average across 300 runs. We ran these on the three experiments presented in Stevens et al. 2017, including the Ewan Smith, the Truswell et al., and the Cohn et al. I don't have time to present these, um, but they are all in the paper. I will tell you some takeaways. So integrating memory maintains the performance of pursuit in capturing the human performance and also improves global models. MGX captures more of the trends in experimental data than the original global model. The study that I will present is Ewan Yurofsky 2008, which is a homophone learning study. This was a complex cross-situational word learning task in which participants learned homophones and single meaning words. There were two conditions, masked and interleaved, and these referred to the presentations of the two meanings of the homophones. In the masked condition, first you saw the homophone just with its first meaning, um, and you'd see it with its first meaning multiple times, and then you'd see it with the second meaning. In the interleaved condition, if you saw the homophone with its first meaning, then the next time you'd see it with the second meaning, and the next time you'd see it with the first, and so it would alternate. Some takeaway results from this experimental study are that cross-situational word learning can facilitate the learning of homophones. The mass condition results in a better learning of the first meaning over the second, so there's a strong primacy effect. And the interleaved condition results in a decreased performance even on single meaning words. So if we look here, the first meaning is preferred over the second in experiment one, which is the mass condition, and in experiment two, performance is dropped overall, including the single meaning words, which are at the blue bar. Let's just think about how pursuit works. Pursuit does not quite have the capability to learn two meanings, and when we run it on the experiment, we see that it never adds the homophones or any of the homophones' meanings to its lexicon. While the patterns are captured, the association values are quite low, indicating a great deal of uncertainty. Also, pursuit doesn't offer a story as to why the behavior is the way it is, while MBP does. With the global model, it's surprising that the changed conditions the interleaved condition um, has an impact on the single meaning words, um, which we see in MGX, where we can capture the drop in performance of the homophones between the two conditions, but the single meaning words, um, but in the single meaning words, the blue bars, the performance is pretty similar. We do get a slight primacy effect, but overall MGX overperforms. So we see that we're, they're hitting very close to perfect here. MBP captures all three of the experimental results and has similar values, at least more similar than MGX, to human performance. We see that the model per performs above chance in all of these, um, where chance is at 0.25, and there is a slight primacy effect in the mass condition, um, seen both here and in the combined bar. And most importantly, in the interleaved condition, um, there's a drop in performance of even the single meaning words, which are the blue bars again. And so this provides support for the story that the decrease in performance results um, from an increased memory load. We see that the memory constraint allows for homophone learning slash the violation of mutual exclusion, although MBP has other properties that allow it to outperform MGX. Additionally, MBP provides a more cohesive account of learning in this complex task than Pursuit does, which is why we think that it's a promising direction to go for cross-situational word learning models. We can account for the development by increasing the size of the memory buffer, for which we have some preliminary results. We can attribute individual differences in task performance to varying sizes of the memory buffer. We've enabled these models, both the local and the global, to learn homophones and found that presentation order does matter because in the mass condition, the model can learn, that is, move a word meaning pair to the lexicon, freeing up space in the buffer, while in the interleaved condition, it would have to continue building just in the buffer. So if there are more objects, then it would be more difficult to learn. In the homophone learning study, we see that in the interleaved condition, there are 18 total objects learned concurrently, since there are six homophones with two meanings each and six single meaning words, while in the mass condition, there would be a total of 12, as we'd see the first meanings first and then the second meanings. So we do see that difference there. We're excited about the work that we're doing, and I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much.